Hello, my name is Reto Meyer. And I'm Ian Neal Lewis. We'll be looking at home screen widgets and interviewing Kevin Barry of Tesla Coil Software to learn some tips and tricks for improving the efficiency of your widgets. All in the next 30 minutes on this week's App Clinic. <coughs> home screen widgets are an interesting category as they can be either released by themselves or value adds to existing apps. Now, by providing a window into your app directly on the home screen, widgets can be a powerful tool for increasing user engagement and encouraging people to get back to your app. Now, to get started, you really need to think about how you're going to present your widget. So perhaps more than any other app type, widgets really need a lot of attention to detail on the design side, even before you start developing. That's right, because they're always there and they're very, very small. Absolutely. Uh, so start by checking out the widget design patterns on the design tab at developer.android.com. And then it's time to head over to the App Widgets API guide, where you can learn all of the practical details of exactly how you put your design in action. So we're not going to go into the specific details of how to build an app, uh, as all of that information is already available online. But what we do want to do is have a look at uh, some tips for making your widgets a little bit more awesome. Right. Users love widgets as a way to keep information front and center, and as a way to customize your home screen so that it's designed uniquely for you. Now, with limited space available on the home screen, it's important to do a good job to keep your widgets uh, and help them stay front and center. Right. You don't want people getting annoyed with your widgets and uninstalling them. Exactly. So it comes down to doing things like this, not draining the battery, making sure that they have timely, up-to-date information, that they have a UI that's consistent with the platform but is still representative of what your app is trying to do, and that they should be as interactive as they can be. Yeah, absolutely. It's really annoying to have a widget that's just sitting there being a larger version of a shortcut. You exactly. want to be able to not only uh, put information on the screen, but also make it accessible. Uh, so for instance, uh, the calendar widget does mm. a great job of that. And so over the years, the power of widgets has increased as the platform has developed to give greater support for how they can be integrated within it. Now this started with support for collection widgets, including lists and galleries. Uh, and then we added the ability to resize widgets, which told me you know, mm, that's a godsend really nice. <laughs> for my calendar. Uh, more recently, we also provided <clears throat> support to embed widgets directly into the lock screen. And this has uh, opened up a whole new world of possibilities. Absolutely. Now, this sorry. is extremely powerful. Yeah. Uh, it allows you to users to perform actions or view data without even having to unlock their phone. Now, as is typically the case, along with this great power comes a similarly great responsibility. So it's really important to take a few precautions when allowing your widget to be lock screen enabled. Uh, the first thing you want to think about is being careful about exposing information. So the thing is, your lock screen is what you see when the phone's not locked, or when the phone is locked. Mm. So anyone can you know, pick up the phone and see that information. If you're exposing things on that lock screen that have to do with you know, meetings you're having at work uh, that have confidential topics, uh, you know, people that are phoning you, whatever, you have to remember all of that information is going out into the world. Absolutely. In many cases, that's a decision for the users to make, particularly with something like calendar or mm -hmm. email. It's up to you how sensitive you think that is. Uh, but you need to make sure as a developer that it's really obvious to your users what data or actions that they're effectively removing that lock screen protection from. Now, for most user data, that's fairly obvious. Uh, but especially for actions, it's important to protect any actions that might cost the user money or risk uh, exposing private information. You, make you want to make sure that's an act in an activity that's launched from the widget, mm -hmm. not uh, directly available on the widget itself. And you know, even though it's uh, it should be obvious to the user what they're exposing when they add a calendar or text message or recent calls, uh, a widget to their home screen, you might want to give them a little reminder anyway because hmm. a lot of times you think, oh yeah, I'm going to put my calendar there and you don't dig deep and think, yeah. wow, sometimes my calendar has some pretty sketchy stuff on it. <laughs> Absolutely. So today we're going to look at three home screen widgets, starting with the minimalist shortcut and terror clock widgets. And then we'll break out the scalpels for a particularly penetrating look at dash clock from our very own Roman Nurek, who turns out isn't a very good designer at all and his app is <laughs> garbage. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's take a look at Minimalist Shortcut. OK, so I, I love that this widget maintains its philosophy within its logo and banner. So it's all about minimalism, and they've, they've taken that approach here. Uh, I'd probably go a step further, though, and consider removing 
the declutter your home screen text and really tighten up that banner a little bit more. Um, I think don't think it really adds a lot of information and actually just makes it a little bit less minimalist. Oh, so you know, I, I actually have the opposite feel. I yeah? I think it's kind of cool actually. Okay, well there you go. Um, now. This is a screenshot uh, provided in their Google Play listing. And it's worth noting that it's not immediately obvious where the widget actually is. Um, but that's as much a feature as it is a bug in this particular instance, as the, the point of this app is to try and have these uh, very minimalistic widgets. Now, one of the confusing things is that each of the screenshots has a different wallpaper and a slightly different layout. So it's difficult to tell what's a widget and what's a background and when things are changing and how. So in any case, you can see what they're trying to achieve here with each of those tiny little androids, uh, really light gray on the dark gray background uh, along the edge of the screen. Now, I wanted to start by calling out a common challenge for widget developers. And if you're building an app that happens to have a widget, then there's a variety of things that you can do to help encourage your users to check out the widget. And even if they never find it, they can still use the app. But what if, as in this case, it's just a widget? Well, a lot of developers will still choose to include a launcher activity to help users find and activate that widget. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's perfectly appropriate. It stops people from hitting install and then going, oh, I installed your app and I can't find it. But as this is going to be the user's first interaction with your app, it's really important to make sure that the aesthetic of your app is maintained in this introductory activity. So in the case of minimalist widget, that means paying a little more attention to the padding and maybe even considering switching to something like a light style with a white background, something which matches the banner, the logo, this idea of minimalism. It's also worth noting that the specific instructions, like the ones given here, they're going to change depending on the OS version. And in fact, on my Jelly Bean device, this doesn't work. Long pressing on the, uh, on the home screen doesn't bring up the widget chooser. So it's something you want to think about when providing specific instructions that you may want to check to see what version of the OS it is. And even still, a lot of users are going to have their own custom launches, their own custom home screens, which are going to be different again. Um, so you really want to consider perhaps providing links to external resources rather than telling people exactly what they should do. Now, it's worth mentioning that um, when you're talking about the padding, this is one thing that makes your app look really unprofessional mm. is, is when they, you've just got a big block of text and it goes all the way across, because obviously you didn't really do any layout. But as I learned uh, while we were trying to do some sample apps last week, it's actually really, really difficult to make that look attractive. So we're going to put out a sample app fairly soon here mm -hmm. uh, about making good readable text layouts uh, that work from uh, Froyo on up. You can do it uh, with spaces mm -hmm. on Jelly Bean, but uh, you, uh, Jelly Bean, I, I think actually ICS I think had ICS it. Well, yeah. uh, but pre ICS, you didn't have it. So the purpose of Minimalist Shortcut, as I've kind of implied already, is to let you have shortcuts to your favorite apps while keeping your screen as simple as possible. It's basically a way of having shortcuts without covering up your awesome wallpaper. Uh, now, they're currently in beta. So um, if this sounds like something you're into, now would be a great time to download the app, provide them some feedback, help them build something even more awesome. Now, speaking of which, uh, here's a little a bit of candid feedback for you guys to, to help you create an even better app. Um, this is the config activity that's displayed when you add a new widget. It's got everything you need, but the presentation could be a little challenging, shall we say? Now, this is something that comes up a lot on the App Clinic, and I know a lot of developers um, you know, find this to be kind of really nitpicky advice. So I'm going to explain just really quickly why this is so important, why we keep harping on about this. Most users are going to judge both the utility and quality of an app within the first few seconds of opening it up. Now, fairly or not, most of that judgment is instinctual, and it's based on the UI aesthetics and the usability of that app. So that first impression here is of something really quite complex. Um, there's this list of options that's totally comprehensive, but that also means it's really long. So I'm scrolling for a long time before I see everything that's there. Now, as a first time user, I'm not sure which of these settings is required, which are optional. And in fact, the most important setting, the one which lets me choose the shortcuts and the icons that I want to use, isn't obvious to find. And in fact, it's not even here on the front page. Now, getting this right is a challenge. Uh, and in fact, it's probably the area for a lot of widgets where you're going to need to spend the most time in terms of your design is figuring out how do you present this one-off config settings to people in a way that they can find intuitive and not, um, you know, not challenging. Uh, you want to have the things that you need there without hiding too much of the functionality. But you don't want to display everything and intimidate them until they go away. So in a lot of cases, this is where good defaults and easy editing comes in really handy. You just need to make it really easy for me to create that first widget. 
and then with some really sensible defaults. So in, in this example, you may choose some of the most common uh, you know, prepackaged apps, build shortcuts to them directly with what you think are the most common icons, and then make it really easy for users to click something within your widget set to, to edit that and modify it. All right. So that's uh, that's all I want to talk about in terms of uh, in terms of minimalist shortcuts. Uh, pretty good app, I think. It's basically some some nitpicky UI changes which could make it even more powerful. So let's take a look at uh, TerraTime by top developer Sterling Udell. Now I love the icon. A little less excited about the banner, which is a little crowded. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah, I, this is one of those banners where it feels like there there was a lot of effort put into a certain set of elements on the banner, and then the rest of it was like handed off to an intern or something. I mean, the, the Terra Time there is um, it's in a really flat font. It's it's not probably the best font for this. Uh, it would be very difficult to read on a small device. But the background bitmap, I love. It's mm. really cool. Absolutely, and it, it gives you a really good indication of the app. Now, I should point out, having looked at Terra Time, uh, and this is this is not a new app. Uh, you can see that uh, Sterling is in fact one of our top developers. So uh, this is a really popular app that a lot of people love. Uh, and once we get to, to see some of the screenshots, you'll see just how beautiful it is. Um, and so making sure that that first impression is consistent with the awesome graphics of the app itself, I think, is you know a really simple but important first step that you can take. Interesting. Now, uh, unlike minimalist shortcuts, TerraTime is an app as well as a widget. Uh, so it has the advantage of being able to show this when you launch the app. Uh, now, this is a pretty stunning UI. You've got the, the, the Earth semi-lit based on the current time. You've even got the, the lights in the, in the night sky um, you know, showing on the area that, uh, that is currently at night, um, which is incredible. But we're not looking at apps today. Um, so let's take a look at the widgets that you can install. Um, so there are, in fact, two of them, and this is what they look like. Uh, and they're both visually stunning. They're really good examples of the power of a widget to really customize your home screen and make it something that you really like to look at. Um, and I think it's fair to say that both of these options are significant improvements over the default uh, analog clock widget, I think. Yeah. Um, so Sterling's biggest challenge here is really around efficiency. He's got this rich dynamic content that needs to be regularly updated. And when you're building widgets, it's vital that you minimize the required update frequency of them and also minimize the amount of data that you're regularly sending to your widget. So you'll note, for example, that there's no second hand on the display. So at most, he's only going to need, the up, uh, need to update that widget every minute. And hopefully, he's found ways to do it even less frequently than that. It's also great to see that both widgets are resizable. And they're available as lock screen widgets as well. And in fact, after playing with this today, uh, I've set the globe widget as my new default uh, home screen icon, uh, lock screen icon. Uh, because it just looks so stunning. Uh, and they've done a really great job in that it scales really well uh, between when it's sort of the full lock screen between when the keyboard is available and, and, the, and that um, the globe is compressed. So you know, really thrilled, uh, really impressive. And uh, we're going to learn some of the tricks that you can use to have something like this, this rich UI, um, without draining the battery uh, or you know, risking crashing the launcher uh, when we talk to Kevin later today. So uh, let's finally, let's take a look at uh, Dash Clock, a new release from our very own room in Europe. I think you looked at this in a little more detail. Yes, yes. And let's just get it out of the way right now. This is a masterpiece of beautiful, clean, intuitive design. It <laughs> sets the standard by which all maps should be me measured. And uh, it's the last lock screen widget you will ever need. So let's rip it apart a little bit. <laughs> um, so first off, the, uh, the lock screen, or I'm sorry, the uh, uh, I mean, the feature graphic, hmm. I think, could be a little bit better done. I mean, the the, um, the title has more space that it could take up. Hmm. Uh, I don't think you should be afraid of letting your title overlap other elements in your scene. It needs to be really, really big. Hmm. Absolutely. And especially with ex extremely minimalist uh, feature graphic, it could really use a little bit more. In fact, I would take out the device uh, with a 3D look and maybe just zoom in on the widget itself to help people understand what it is. But um, <clears throat> you really are just bitter because there's all those gradients in the background. I know. He never lets me do gradients. I think he has the gradient license. Well, it makes me feel a little bit better that he still feels forced to use that, uh, that horrid blue that he <laughs> makes us use. <laughs> <laughs> OK. so. 
this is a wonderful app. Um, it, this is what you see when the app is launched. Uh, there's a very obvious set of uh, extensions. It's really, really easy to understand how you're going to add an extension because he went ahead and put a, an add extension button at the, as the uh, last thing in this list. Uh, it's really easy to manage the extensions. In fact, the only complaint I had was that, probably because I'm old, uh, I wasn't able to rearrange the extensions mm. uh, very easily. You know, once you get a lot of extensions in here, Roman did put in a great uh, drag and drop rearranger. It's very, very fast. It's very, very fluid. But it only works if you grab the absolute left-hand side, there where that little bitmap handle is, the, mm. the one that says grab me, obviously. <laughs> But the reason I, I feel like this is a, worth talking about is that you can swipe the notification or swipe the extension to dismiss it just like a notification. And you can swipe it from anywhere. So the horizontal swiping works when your finger's anywhere on the extension, and vertical swiping only works in one place. And that, that kind of confused me. I thought that was unnecessary. Uh, you'll notice that some extensions, but not all, have extra screens available. And notice that Roman's put really nice looking chevrons. Oh, I'm just kidding. He put a settings icon on the ones that have settings, so it's really obvious how to get to the second page if there is one. And it's also really obvious which extensions don't have a second page. So bravo there. <clears throat> the second page is also an interesting study in how to do an action bar, right? So he's gone to a page of settings for an extension which may or may not have been written by the author of the app, uh, because Dash Clock actually accepts third-party extensions. It's really kind of cool. Hmm. So he's changed the action bar from blue to black, and then, of course, put a, a nice little icon in the corner there to let you know when, how you can get back to your main settings page. When you actually use this widget, um, it can display in two different modes. There's the sort of compact mode here where you see just the clock and a minimal version of some of the widgets or extensions that you've chosen, or the full mode where you can see all of the information. The only thing that I thought was difficult to use about this app actually was that while I can customize a great deal about the appearance, I couldn't customize it with a preview that was on top of my wallpaper. So as you can see, it was difficult for me to get a set of appearance settings that actually worked with the kind of busy wallpaper that I have on my phone. So I was a little disappointed in that. I was also a little disappointed in some of the extensions. I actually don't know which ones Roman wrote and which ones other people wrote, but as you can see, uh, in this shot, there's a couple of extensions. You know, for instance, the upcoming alarms uh, or the mail extension that are perfect. Just a little icon with all of the information you need. But there's a couple of other extensions that get cut off and ellipsified, and that seems to me to be a really big problem. I don't know if that area is just too small, or if it needs some some more design thought, or maybe. Uh, Roman just needs to do something about third-party extensions, but as soon as you see ellipses in that area, you're really confused. Uh, the only other thing that I was a little bugged about was uh, the appearance dialog, which I don't have a, a screenshot of. And the reason I don't is because I've got a lot of nitpicks, but they're all design nits, and they, they don't have really have anything to do with the app clinic. So Rome and I are going to have a little meetup in New York, and I'm going to show him exactly what's going on. And then, uh, if I'm lucky, I'll be back to the show. But <laughs> no you guarantees. never know. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead and move on. So uh, some of the most important aspects of building good widgets are pretty much invisible to the user. Yeah, but they're not invisible to the app that's hosting your widgets. <laughs> uh, so luckily, we have the developer of several app widget hosting apps, uh, Kevin Berry of Tesla Coil. And he is the developer of the uh, app launcher Nova Launcher. Yeah, we interviewed him uh, yesterday to find out what he's learned about good widget design. 
So to find out a little bit more about how you can build really great quality widgets, we've got Kevin Barry from Tesla Coil Software, developer of a very popular home screen replacement, Nova Launcher. Now he's been developing a Nova Launcher, which is a replacement for the home screen, which means he can see firsthand what happens when you build a widget which doesn't really work very well. So uh, let's, uh, let's throw it over to Kevin and find out a little bit more. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and Tesla Coil Software? Uh, sure. So, um, as Rito said, I'm Kevin. Uh, I do Nova Launcher and Widget Lacquer, which both can host widgets. Um, TestaQuest software is just me, uh, so it's a, a small operation. Uh, Nova Launcher is built off the open source Android launcher, so that gives me a good, a good base to work with. Excellent, excellent. And uh, so it's just yourself. Are you able to do this full time, or is this a, a hobby that you do on the weekends? Uh, yeah, this has been my full time job for uh, like widget. Just widget locker alone was enough to be my full time job. Uh, so oh, that's fantastic. It's well uh, for me. Always, always good to see uh, someone who's able to take uh, something fun and turn it into a day job. So uh, nicely done. Um, all right, so I guess what we're talking about today is widgets. Um, and so, can you tell us a little bit about how you know how is it that you're able to uh, give us some of these uh, these efficiency gains, or how how do you get that extra insight into what makes a good widget? Um, so a lot of a launcher is displaying the widgets and being fast and smooth. Um, and displaying the widgets is a lot harder than you would think. Um, the widgets are generally content rich, which it makes sense for the widget provider and it makes sense for the user. They want to see their beautiful images, um, but it uses a fair amount of memory. Um, and so this uh, just using the memory, Nova Launcher can hit its memory, or any launcher can hit its memory limit from having too many of these uh, widgets. Um, or changing out these images can car cause garbage collection, which is going to slow the scrolling of the launcher. Um, so really, I like to see the, the well-designed widgets that are just using the right image size or that are using these images. Uh, they're sending them efficiently so that it's less work on the launcher and it keeps everything smooth. All right, so basically, um, the, the, better the, the better the widget, the more uh, smooth, fast, and efficient your launcher can be. Yeah. Um, and users care about this, and they will start noticing it's it's not the launch, it's the widget, um, <laughs> and they'll ask me for widget recommendations. So. <laughs> nice. So that's uh, yet another vested interest. It's interesting. It's something we found last year at I/O. We made a big deal about um, you know Project Butter making everything smoother and faster and everything else. Um, so it becomes incredibly important when you're embedding someone else's app, you know, their widget into your app. Uh, you know, if you want what you're doing to be smooth and buttery, and users, like you say, really do care, you know, it's important that the things you're putting in there work as well. Um, mm. So, what are some of the most common uh, best practices, or I guess maybe anti-patterns, uh, either way you want to look at it, that you've you've seen uh, widget developers use or not use, which uh, you'd like to share? Um, yes. Yeah, so the uh, the main thing I wanted to talk about was um, how to set the images, and so uh, there's two popular ways of setting images. Um, one is to use the remote views. They have a uh, set bitmap or set image view bitmap. Um, and this is pretty nasty. If you use it for a small bitmap, it's fine. And it's convenient because you just generate your bitmap and you send it. But what has to happen here is first, your service, uh, your widget service, has to make a copy of all the pixels in the bitmap. So that's a large amount. Then it gives it to the Android framework, uh, where that has to hold on to it for a little while. And then it sends it to the launcher. The launcher then has to unparcel that so it's creating another copy of it. So you have a large amount, double the memory needed for the image. And then we can ultimately display it. Um, so this is, it's creating garbage. And Android has a transaction size limit. So you individually can only transfer so much. And I only individually can receive so much. And if, like, if I have too many widgets sending me updates at once, um, I can't handle it. I'll crash. Um, so this, you sending bitmaps through, through parcels, through binders, is just, it's bad. Um, there's a better method, which is to use the image view set image URI. Um, and so this means that your binary overhead is really small. You're just making an URI and sending that over. Then the launcher itself loads it. Um, this, uh, th there's some tricks to using this, though, too. Uh, it means you have to have a URI, so you need a content provider for it. Um, and previously, I've seen widgets use the file colon slash 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 as the URI. And this worked, but some future version of Android is going to have the read external storage permission. And the default launcher doesn't have that at this time. I kind of doubt it'll get it. So you don't want to be using this uh, file colon slash 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 URI. Instead, you need to create your own kind of wrapper URI that can just open up the, the input stream and send it, uh, send it on. 
Um, I don't have a good example of that as I'm not making the widget, I'm just receiving it. Mm -hmm. Another downside of the set image array is it's not asynchronous, um, but neither is the set, the, the set image view bitmap. This is something that hopefully a future version of the Android framework can help with is letting widgets update images asynchronously, not lagging the launcher. And you still want to use small images here, because even if uh, you know now you're not creating a copy of it, but you're still giving this potentially large image to launch display. And if the launcher just has to scale it down, that's taking time to scale it, and it's using up the launcher's memory buffer. Um, I've seen like some contact widgets, uh, scrollable contact widgets, so they'll look nice, you can fling through and they scroll. But when you fling through, it goes <laughs> And it's, they're loading like the full-size contact uh, picture, which could be like a 1,000 pixels wide. Nice. Um, and you're displaying it at 96 by 96. <laughs> so you really want to scale those ahead of time, save them to the SD card, or save them to your internal storage or something, and then just give the launcher the smallest version you need. That makes a lot of sense. I, I wonder if uh, along the same lines, using something like uh, uh, oh, I can't remember exactly the name, but a drawable where you're able to set the image level so that you have basically, rather than having to send through the, the bitmap or the drawable uh, every time you want to change it, you could just basically send through the uh, the int value of the level that you want to display. Would that sort of approach work uh, similarly? Um, yeah, for something like, uh, I imagine like a bitmap clock, you could use something like that. Um, but for something where you're getting dynamic content, mm. uh, you know, if it's not in your resources, you're not going to be able to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, so going along the same lines, you know, you mentioning that you know if you get too many updates from too many uh, widgets at the same time, then that's going to cause you uh, problems in, in processing all of those. Uh, and something which we've talked about before as well, which is widgets. It's important to keep them updated, uh, but it's also important not to refresh them too often. From your experience, do you have sort of a best practice what you would recommend as uh, an appropriate uh, frequency with which to refresh your widgets? Um, I guess it's it really just happens when it happens. Like uh, Nova Launcher actually tries if you're if you're scrolling through the screen, it tries to kind of defer those widget updates. Mm -hmm. um, but it's tricky to do that. Uh, the sure. framework's not really built for that, so it can't always manage to do so. Um, really, the only the only real problem I've had is when the people have had animated widgets, <laughs> which Android does not support animated widgets, and oh, any hack to do it is it, it slows the whole system to a crawl. It's really bad. Don't do animated widgets. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the, the key tips that we say is, uh, you know, you should really only be updating kind of on demand um, and certainly no more frequently than every sort of 30 minutes. It's almost like you want to send as much content to a widget as you can and then have it use things like uh, image pages to, you know, modify the content without having to sort of send stuff to it to constantly have to process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wonder, uh, you know, efficiency aside, are there certain um, things which you're seeing a lot of people making mistakes on, things causing crashes in, in widgets which uh, you then have to deal with when, within your launcher? Um, yeah, so widgets can crash, can and do crash the launcher. <laughs> um, so uh, Nova Launcher tries to, to catch these and just crash the widget, not the whole thing. Um, but then I save crash reports so I can try to contact widget developers, um, but I can't always. So some common things are there's a, a legal state exception uh, that can happen if you update a list view adapter uh, not from the UI thread without, uh, this can happen to any list view, but it happens to widgets too. Um, so when you're updating the adapter used for your scrollable widget, make sure you're following the best practices there. You're updating it from the UI thread and you're notifying changes. Um, there's transaction too large, which I kind of touched about before, which is generally that's from bitmaps. But no matter what you're doing, don't don't embed a huge amount of information in your widget update. Um, try to get it from a content provider if you can. Um, oddly enough, there's security exceptions sometimes. Um, sometimes the sometimes widgets will ask the launcher to displace them from a content provider it doesn't have access to, um, <laughs> like getting something from a contacts provider or whatever. Um, I imagine these are caught pretty quickly, but some like. The LG launcher does have more permissions. It has permissions to the contact provider. So if you just test on some skinned phone, you're not necessarily going to see these. So you definitely want to test on a third-party launcher as well. Yeah, and that's, um, that's a good point as well, right? In that uh, the widgets themselves are running within your uh, or the launcher's process, uh, which means that the uh, permissions which your app needs or which your widget needs are dependent on what the uh, the home screen uh, the the launcher actually has. And you can't like. 
you know, Noble Lunch actually does, it is able to read from that SD card because I use it for other things. Um, you can't count on a launcher having that. Uh, mm. the, the default Android launcher doesn't. Um, well, it does now because Android allows anything to. But when Android doesn't, the Android launch, the default launcher probably won't. Um, and, and the different launchers behave different. This is different from the, the widget crashing. But the uh, on the Galaxy S3, the default launcher, it's Samsung's launcher, doesn't apply any padding to the widgets. Um, mm. But Ice Cream Sandwich said that widgets get uh, it's generally 80 dp of padding. So if you test your widget in the Samsung launcher and then you test it in a third party launcher or you test it in the stock Android launcher, you're going to see the padding is different. Um, and there's not, you can't really control this and you can't detect, well, if I'm running on Samsung, I'm going to add extra padding because they might be using a third party launcher. Um, so just test so it looks good either with the padding, the that stock Android has or without which touch which doesn't have. Yeah, it's a really good point for testing as well. Sorry, I interrupted John. Um, sure. One more exception I wanted to, to point out was um, when you're you, when you're dealing with a list view and you have different view types, so this is sometimes you have a header and then you have a the actual item, um, you have to return a count for get view type count. And so in a normal app, if you don't return the correct value here while you're scrolling through it, your app will crash. Mm -hmm. In the case of widgets, if you return wrong get view type count, uh, then the, the launcher itself is going to crash. <laughs> uh, you'll see the right index out of bounds exception on add scrap view is the key there. Um, so just the fix is to probably increase your get view type count to the correct number. Right, that's a good tip. Um, that's actually a good point you made earlier as well about testing. I think a lot of people are going to you know, just use an emulator or whichever device they happen to own to test their widgets, um, not considering the fact that not only are you going to have different home screens from different manufacturers, um, but in fact users may download things like Nova Launcher to have their own uh, you know, third party uh, launcher. So I think it's a, a good tip for people building widgets to test on multiple launcher implementations to make sure it doesn't just work on stock Android. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's that's definitely really helpful. I think uh, a lot of really good tips there for people building widgets. Um, it would be remiss of me not to ask what some of your favorite widgets are. Um, one widget I like, but may, uh, other developers will probably like, but users won't, is AppMonger, um, which it shows your app sales for the day or whatever you set it to. <laughs> nice. Um, so that's nice to have on your home screen, so you keep an eye on how your, your apps are doing. Absolutely. Um, Android Pro Widgets is another nice set. They have scrollable widgets for like Twitter and uh, calendar and everything, and contacts. Um, and I've worked with the developer there to work out some performance issues. Uh, so they're pretty good now about uh, using proper size images and everything. Excellent. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time. I uh, very much appreciate you coming on and sharing some of your experience and wisdom on uh, widget creation uh, with our audience. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, we'll hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks. Bye. So, some really useful tips there from Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. That was fascinating. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for stopping by. We appreciate it, and uh, and would invite any of the developers whose uh, apps we're going to be uh, looking at to uh, to get in touch and uh, oh, you know offer some of their own feedback. So, our next step is to take a closer look at today's apps and see how close they are to being pure Android. Uh, so to do that, as always, we're going to pass them through each of these checklists. Uh, <clears throat> until then, uh, we can uh, you can find our Pure Android collection at bit.ly slash pureandroid. And you can nominate your app for consideration by adding it to our Trello page. Uh, you can find that by searching for App Clinic Trello. We've actually updated this recently to give a little bit more insight into exactly what we're planning to do week over week. So we're going to be reaching out to some developers specifically uh, to ask if we can uh, review their apps online. And we would encourage you to self-nominate by going there finding out what's, uh, what's happening in the coming weeks and throwing your app in there. It would also help us out if you uh, give us some contact details so we can reach out and talk to you beforehand. Absolutely. Now, before we go, I got to ask you this, because we talked about how uh, the, the uh, minimal launcher had uh, an app icon mm -hmm. that's in the launcher so that you can get to its settings page. Roman's uh, widget launcher does not. Mm. I think it should. What do you think? I think it's a really interesting question. I think um, if you're building if you're building a widget which is going to target pretty much every Android device which can have widgets, then I think it probably makes sense to have some sort of icon there. 
The challenge or opportunity with Romans is that it, it's only available for devices running Android 4.2. Uh, and now especially, that tends to be pretty new phone purchases, more at the sort of uh, upper end of the techie, geeky sort of equilibrium. Uh, so the sorts of people installing and using the app may be more likely to be able to find the advanced features such as uh, lock screen widgets. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's kind of a tricky call. Um, but yeah. yeah, I think you know some of the challenges that we talked about, the fact that you, know, you can't even give really simple step-by-step -step instructions on how to install the widget means that well, you know, if you're the one who has to explain how to install widgets, your chances of them finding it and uh, finding it useful are probably pretty low. Yeah, I always used to hate it when somebody would install a, a, an icon for their live wallpaper, right? That, yeah. <laughs> and the only thing that, that made me think otherwise was that Roman's widget is not just a widget. It's also a container for other widgets. Yes. Yeah, this is a good point. Something to think about. We'd love to hear what you guys think about that and other questions. So go ahead and give us a shout out on Google+. And we'll be back next week. Uh, don't forget to join Roman, Nick, and Adam on Android Design in Action next Tuesday. And until that, until next week, uh, I'm Redo Meyer. And I'm Ian Nee Lewis. And this has been The App Clinic. Goodbye.